I joined the Bipolar Book Club in 1996. I was a first semester senior at Rice University. And the invitation I received to this book club didn't come in the way that typical book club invitations have in my life. You know, like when your fun friend comes up to you and says, hey, I'm starting a book club. And you say, I love books. And before you can really get that sentence out, she says, don't worry. You don't have to read any of the books. <laughs> and there will be a ton of wine. <laughs> this invitation was different. I guess the best way to say it would be that my invitation to the Bipolar Book Club came from the universe with a little assist from my dad. When I moved in that year, I had no, I, I had no idea anything was, was going to be different about that year. Um, I, I had been selected to be one of 10 senior interviewers at Rice. I was an orientation week for Han Solo week, which was our big splash for all the incoming nerds at Rice. And I was on pace to graduate with honors. I had even managed to purloin from my fellow coordinators the large Han Solo cutout with blaster for my room. So that was very exciting. <laughs> life was good. And then in late September, life started feeling a little too good. What started out as a good mood became euphoria. My thoughts raced, the world looked visibly brighter. I thought everything f seemed connected to each other and there was symbolism in all that I saw in the world. At night, my energy kept up. I couldn't sleep at all. In fact, instead of sleeping, I started listening to the Beatles' White Album over and over again and mapping my life out to the words of John Paul, George, and Ringo. And in case you're wondering, yes, the White Album is a red flag <laughs> when it comes to insanity. Um, after about four nights of this, I realized that um, I couldn't read. I picked up a book to read it for an assignment the next day, and I could see the letters on the page, but they weren't forming words in my brain. And it was terrifying. Uh, two weeks later, my mom would walk into my dorm room and see a stack of books piled onto each other because I had been sitting there on my ridiculous black target beanbag chair trying to read all of these books, and I couldn't. I knew something was terribly wrong. Not even Han Solo could save me. Um, but I didn't know what it was. My best guess was adult onset ADHD or something like that. There was no internet for me to reach out to and find out what this might be. So that night, I stayed up yet again, staring at the ceiling, praying for sleep, not sleeping, and thoughts just cascading all through my brain. If you know anything about manic episodes, you may have heard that they're drug-fueled orgies of binging on things from shopping to gambling. Not my mania. I am living proof that even a very severe mental illness can be outweighed by sheer dorkiness. <laughs> even on my last day on campus, I was still going to class. And after I went to class, I went to an appointment with my favorite professor, Dr. Grobe, my Shakespeare professor. I can't remember exactly what I said in that meeting with him, but I know that I rambled. I know that it was what the uh, specialists call pressured speech. I know I mentioned the United Nations, and I know that I ended up with my 
head in my hands crying. We were just supposed to be at, talking about what I was going to do after graduation, you know, maybe law, maybe journalism. Dr. Grobe didn't really have United Nations on the menu that day, but he was a very caring man and he had a daughter who had been diagnosed years before with depression and he asked me very gently if I would be willing to go to the counseling center. We went to the counseling center. The counselors talked to me for, for a pretty long time, couple, like an hour or two, and they decided that the best thing for me was to go to the hospital. They asked me, are you willing to go to the hospital? I was picturing like the standard hospital with nothing more embarrassing than the backless gown. And I have no problems with backless gowns because they're among the only gowns I don't have to get tailored. So <laughs> I was good with that. I agreed to go to the hospital. I was exhausted. I was exhausted. I hadn't slept in days. I hadn't been on drugs. I hadn't been drinking. There were none of the usual suspects involved. I had just lost my mind. A police car came to pick me up on the curb outside of the main building at Rice, in the front of Rice Lovett Hall. And I was alone in the back of the police car and he drove me to a hospital. I don't need to tell you, it was a psych ward. It was a psychiatric hospital. And I was just as much of a fit for that place as every other patient there. Over the next couple of weeks, things went from bad to worse. I decided that four other patients were the Beatles, despite the fact that they were all African-American men minding their own business in the cafeteria. I thought the TVs were talking to me, and even worse, I thought the TVs were telling me that I was like totally super in love with a guy at Rice that I did not have any sort of crush on, but that I, you know, I still decided to call him from the hospital and explain to him my undying love. That was horrible. That may be the worst part. <laughs> <laughs> One day, I woke up and I decided that I was the Virgin Mary. Um, I think, well, I know I had gained a lot of weight on institutional pie and ice cream because no manic person counts calories, and also for medication. And I was using a blue towel over my wet hair, and I think my crazy brain just sort of interpreted that as Virgin Mary. This is, this is how bad it was. I saw auras around people. If, I'd, if someone had struck me the wrong way, I'd see kind of a brackish, dark aura. If they seemed light and kind, they were getting a light aura. I saw angels, I saw demons, and some of those moments were the most terrifying in my life. I ended up, after I got out of the hospital, using a nightlight for the first time since I was seven. Mania itself is hard enough, but one of the more difficult aspects of it is that you're both aware while you're in the manic episode that it's going on, and later as you're coming out of it, you become aware of what has happened. And although at first I just kind of heard words being bandied about by the doctors around, you know, bipolar, bipolar one, manic depression, First, at first, they were just words. It was like a foreign language. But one day, it clicked. I had totally lost my mind. I had lost my mind. I was in a psych ward, the nut house, the loony bin, the away, and they're coming to take you away. I was going to be on medication for the rest of my life. I was going to have to explain this to people one day if they were close to me, if I ever dated somebody for a lengthy period of time, this was probably gonna need to come up. And 
I was 21. I knew what society thought about crazy people. When I was little, we used to play this game, MASH. Mansion, apartment, shack, house. There you go. Well, for crazy people, a lot of those aren't options. It's more like asylum, attic, shelter, street. And my daughter would love to tell you what that spells out, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, be, I was aware of that, and I was despairing of that, like many people who go through this are. And my dad came in at just the right moment. He came in with books. He came in with books by Patty Duke, the actress, the miracle worker who ended up doing some miracle work in my life. And he came in with another book by K. Redfield Jameson, who was a psychologist at Johns Hopkins and who had succeeded incredibly despite having faced the odds of a bipolar diagnosis. I read these works by these two women and it was slow and painful to read them because I had to wear reading glasses by this time due to the medication's effects on me and my hands were shaking from the medication too. I probably was also holding the book out here because of my large Virgin Mary-esque <laughs> gut. Uh, that was resolved later somewhat. Um, anyway, I, I cannot express how much hope that those stories gave me. And they also gave me purpose. I now knew what I needed to do after graduation. Even in 1996, I knew what I needed to do after graduation. I was going to finish, I was going to be successful in something, and then I was gonna tell some other people who were bipolar that they could do it too. So I was just gonna follow the map that Patty and Kay had laid out for me. First, I had to graduate. I went back to Rice the next semester, and miraculously, I graduated on time with a double major and with honors. <laughs> now all I had to do was figure out how to be successful. Like, what was I gonna do? Um, creative writing was out after my time with the Beatles and the White <laughs> Album and all that, so I needed I needed a profession with guardrails. I needed turgid, boring, formulaic prose. That's what I needed. You know what I needed. I needed the law. <laughs> <laughs> so I applied to law school. I went, I did well. I was hired in a big law firm. Um, I saw some demons there, very few angels. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Um, I, I was doing great. I was doing great. Uh, in 2006, I decided to move to the federal court um, where I had a pro se staff attorney position. In 2008, I got married to my law school sweetheart. And in 2009, I decided that I wanted to get, try to get pregnant. I knew it was a risky proposition to get pregnant. I had to get off all my medication, and I did. And I had a perfectly uneventful pregnancy, and then I crashed five months after my daughter was born. I had to get off the medication because of the potential effects on the fetus. And I had to stay off medication because I was breastfeeding. So I had the twin horrors of no sleep and no medication, and I ended up right back in the psychiatric hospital where I signed myself in again as I had 14 years before. My depression was gripping me with a stranglehold and I spent two years, I came back to the federal court after I got out of the hospital. I was only there for a, for a couple of weeks and I was able to return to work but I was dog paddling from a mood perspective. I was struggling. And over the next two years, I went through a divorce, 
I went through people judging and criticizing me for my divorce, even though my ex-husband and I got along perfectly well. And then my judge announced that he was going to retire from the court. I panicked. I had struggled for two years with this depression, and I had been a shell of myself for two years, and I had not been the mother I'd wanted to be, and I felt like I was a burden to everyone, especially my daughter. I was going to be the sick, catatonic mom in the corner, and I did not want my daughter to have to deal with that. And as irrational as it sounds, it made sense in the depressed brain that I had at the time. And I swallowed 57 Ambien, filled up a bathtub, got in the bathtub, and waited to die. I woke up eight hours later. The tub had drained. And I went right back to the hospital. This time, the doctors told me, your condition has become medication resistant. You, you only have one choice left. ECT, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, shock treatment. That was what I had left. That was my option. Well, I mean, first of all, nobody could explain to me how it worked, how it was more than just a placebo effect, what was going on. Secondly, uh, why are we talking about putting electricity through my brain? That's insanity. My dad showed up with more books. This time it was Han Solo's girlfriend, intergalactic princess, Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, with the book about her experience with ECT, and also local author Julie Hirsch with telling about her experience with ECT. I, I wasn't an intergalactic princess, and I also wasn't a wealthy philanthropist like Julie, but I, they had been exactly where I was, a grief-stricken, guilt-ridden, suicidal mom. I had no other option but to try it. I knew if I got released, I would end up killing myself. So I did. I had four rounds of ECT. The first three were pretty uneventful. The last one knocked me into a mini manic episode, but the doctors were like, this is great. She is better. She is better. And I owe such an incredible debt of gratitude to both Carrie and Julie for so honestly telling their stories. I came back after the shock treatment, and uh, three months later, I came back to the federal court after the shock treatment, and three months later, I started working at the bank. That was six years ago. I'm now the bank's general counsel and executive vice president. Here's what I want you all to know. The other gift, my bigger success, is that I have a beautiful eight-year-old daughter. I have a wonderful eight-year-old daughter, and I have no doubt that she has a mother because of that shock treatment. And she has this mother because of the gift of the Bipolar Book Club of Kay Redfield Jameson, Patty Duke, of Julie Hirsch, of Carrie Fisher. All four of them gave me stories that got through some of the toughest times of my life. We all have a story that can help someone. You all probably know a story in your mind that you've never told that can help someone. Stories are such a gift, and the more vulnerable, the more valuable. The great news is you don't have to write a book or stand on a stage to tell your story. You might be at a book club one day. You might say, I've never told anybody this, but dot, 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 you might change someone's life. Thank you. Thank you.